salatu wassalamu ala rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa ala. So uh, a quick announcement inshallah before we begin. There is a uh, Syrian family, a Syrian family who just came and they are badly in need of a place to stay. They don't know where to go so they are here tonight. If someone has a, a basement or a place they can rent them for a short period of time until they find a suitable place. So please come to me after salah and let me know inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Uh, so the khatira for tonight, uh, every time I see kids in the masjid, I'm happy. I know uh, some people when they see kids in the masjid, they, you know, they are mad and they tell them go pray in the back and so on and so forth. But the way I see it, if you don't see kids in the, in the masjid, then there's no future for the community. So every time I see little kids, two years old, three years old, I'm happy, alhamdulillah, because they feel comfortable, they feel welcome in the masjid. And when I see them, I don't really see kids. I see the imams of the future, I see the teachers of the future, the community leaders of the future, and I see the next prime minister of Canada. Why not? We, we need someone like Karim or like Ziad to represent us. The reason our voices are not heard is, is that because we don't speak for ourselves. So we need someone to represent us. We need someone on CBC to speak. We need someone to play hockey, like Nazim Qadri. We need someone to be a politician to, you know, to, to represent us. And, and we need to teach our kids to love Islam, to be good Muslims, and also to be successful Canadians. So inshallah, throughout the month, whenever I get the chance, uh, we will talk. So uh, maybe inshallah, uh, we'll talk about the Battle of Badr, Yawm al-Furqan, brother is here. So inshallah we'll focus on this, but tonight I'm going to talk about something else that I spoke about in a, in a khutbah a long time ago, what we can learn from kids. Uh, because when we look at, at kids, there is nothing we can really learn from them. You know, they bug us, they, uh, we brought them to this world and they kick us out, they make us miserable, they whine, you know, they, they're greedy and so on and so forth. This is how, you know, a lot of us think of kids, but really, Kids, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls them Zinatul Hayat al Dunya. They are the, the beauty of this world, right? And there is so much we can learn from them. If a little kid dies, they go to Jannah because they are pure in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if someone our age dies, then they have to stand for accounting or so on and so forth. So basically, one of the things that we can learn from kids is to be innocent. When, when the kids are born, they are innocent, you know? So subhanAllah, if you look at the tyrants throughout history, Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab and, and Hitler and Tony Blair and George Bush and many others, these people were innocent when they were three, four, five years old. They were pure and innocent. So what happened to them? What made them the horrible people that we know of today? And the fact of the matter is all good people, the prophets, Muhammad Sallallahu and Ibrahim, and the great prophets and the Sahaba Kiram and and uh, Umar al-Mukhtar, Sidi Umar al-Mukhtar, and uh, Alama Iqbal, and, and, and so on and so forth, and Muhammad al-Fatih, the great personalities in Islamic history, Abu Hanifa, Malik Shafi, Bukhari, the great scholars, on one hand, and on the other hand, you have Hitler, you have Mussolini, you have all the tyrants, and Tony Blair, and all these evil people. When they started, they started with the same potential to be good people. You know, they started innocent and pure, but something wrong happened for the second group on the way. So something terrible happened. It's either their family, their society, wrong teachings, wrong philosophies, and this is what led to them being the horrible people that we know of today. But the first group, they, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped them pres preserve this purity in them, al-fitrah. So basically, when you look at the kids in the daycare, when you go there, and I see my young uh, son, Omar ibn Khattab. So basically, uh, in that little room, their world, they see, I see people from Asia, I see people from Africa, people from Europe, Latin America. It's like a mini United Nations. And when I go to pick him up, mashallah, they're playing together, they're smiling, they're sharing toys and everything. So what happens when people grow older, they become racist. Oh, you're black, you're Asian, you're this, you're Latino, amigo. So what happened? You know, it is society that changes this fitra in them. People are not born racist. They are not born thieves. They are not born liars. But they learn along the way and they lose their fitra, they lose their purity. 
The second quality that we learn from kids is to be logical. You know, kids are very logical. For kids, one plus one is two. For a lot of people in this world, one plus one plus one equals one. <laughs> kids are very logical, but for us, sometimes it doesn't make any sense. Like sometimes I'll give you a couple of examples to illustrate. We are not very logical as grown-ups. So you would assume that kids, they're intellectually immature when they're young, and when they mature, they become logical. Actually, the opposite happens. When we become mature and we become intellectually stable, we, we turn to cheat and lie and play games and stuff. But kids are very straightforward. If you want to ask someone if something is good or bad, or the food tastes good, or something looks good or bad, ask a kid. Don't ask grown-ups. They will sugarcoat, they sweet, sweet talk, and the kids they will tell it, will tell it as is. They will say, oh, this is junk. Because they are very honest with you. So basically, some families come to me with their son, 25 years old, 30, they want him, they want to look for someone for him to marry. Okay, what are your expectations? They said, okay, we want a sister who is half of the Quran, minimum 40 Jews. Oh, there is only 30 Jews anyway, but... <laughs> she has to be a sister who is seven times, and Bukhari, Hadith, and... Uh, and their son, the sucker, doesn't even pray. You know? And wallahi, so this is not fair. Why would you look for someone, like, amazing for your son, and your son doesn't even pray? He's not a good guy. Like, this, this is not fair. And I've seen with my own eyes in my village in Egypt. You know, the guy is married to this girl. And when her dad dies, his father-in-law dies, he will go and fight with his in-laws to take her miraf, her, her inheritance. And when his, her, his sister, when their parents die, his own father dies, he fights for her with, with her husband so he doesn't take, you know, his sister's inheritance. So they would like to take from their in-laws, but they didn't want to give their own in-laws when his own dad dies. And this doesn't make any sense to me. Like, Islam is all about fairness. And we try to justify, we try يعني, If something is horrible, we call it good names to make it appealing and so on and so forth. And this is why, this is something that we as humanity, the grown-ups, we do. Like, we call riba interest, we call it interest. Uh, alcohol, they call it spirits. Uh, zina, they call it uh, boyfriend, girlfriend. They, you know, they call things beautiful names. So, uh, there was this story, the guy, like, he used to go to the store to buy cigarettes. And on the cigarettes, they have this warning, uh, if you smoke, you are going to develop cancer over time, like cancer. So they, they, they use this ad on the cigarettes, the cigarette pack for a long time, cancer, cancer, ca cancer. Every time he buys the pack of cigarettes, it shows the cancer and, you know, someone has cancer and so on and so forth. And at some point, they try to use a different technique. So now the adver advertisement was, if you smoke for a long time, this is going to affect your uh, sexual ability. So the guy, the store owner, he said, that one day the same guy, he came and he took one cigarette and after he left, he looked, it doesn't say cancer anymore, it says the, you know, it's gonna affect your sexual ability. So he said the guy came back to him and he returned the pack of cigarettes and he said, no, no, I want the cancer one. <laughs> it's the same thing, it's the same thing. It affects, it will give you cancer, but it will, will also affect your sexual desire. You know, like, uh, people are illogical. So as the last example for today, when you learn a language, you have to do it like kids. This is the best way. How kids learn? Well, they listen to their parents and those around them. Then they start to copy them and talk. Then they read and write. How we do it? We do it upside down. We start by reading and writing. Then the, the last thing we care about is speaking and listening. And this is why many of us, they suffer when we uh, speak a, a second language. We never learn because we do it upside down. There is this story of a brother from Egypt, uh, and uh, he moved to New York. It's a true story. And he stayed there for several months, and you know he didn't take the effort to learn. So he started with reading and writing, and everything is wrong. He didn't focus on, re on uh, speaking and listening. So basically, uh, one day he came, uh, you know, uh, and and uh, he went home. They have this building, apartment building, and they have a guard. An African-American brother was sitting in front of the building, like a guard or something. And 
uh, there, there was a wedding in the building, and the Egyptian brother asked the guard, uh, he even asked him in Arabic, you know, like he assumed that the guy spoke Egyptian. So the guy said, don't know, don't know, dude, don't know. So he, you know, so he assumed that the guy, the guy's name was getting married, was don't know. He, he thought that this is the name. Next day he came from outside and there was a funeral in the building. People were crying, you know, black sunglasses and casket. And, so he asked the same guy, the, the guard, Minmat, who died? And the guy said, don't know. He said, subhanAllah, don't know died? He just got married yesterday. It's like, yeah, so uh, be logical, inshallah, like kids, and we'll continue tomorrow and uh, the day after tomorrow, inshallah. Uh, so the question for last night was, if a sister is pregnant in the month of Ramadan and she's not able to fast, what is the kafara? Uh, the ulama, the madhah, they have different opinions, three of them. And none of them is supported by hadith, though the three of them basically are based on ijtihad. Whichever opinion you follow, it's acceptable. So one madhab will say she will make up the days after Ramadan. One madhab, she, uh, they say she will make up the days and give kafara. Uh, and the third madhab, she will just feed a poor person per day. And I personally, I lean toward the third one, which is she will just feed a poor person. And this is the opinion of Abdullah ibn Abbas, the cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu and he did it in front of the Sahaba and he told his own wife, break the fast, feed a poor person, and, and this is the kafara for you. You don't have to fast. Because one Ramadan she is fasting, the next Ramadan she is uh, nursing, and the one after she, maybe she will be pregnant again, it will become difficult for her to make up the days. But again, you can follow any of the three madahib, they are totally acceptable. And the winner is uh, brother Abu Ibrahim Bukhari. Is he here tonight? Abu Ibrahim Bukhari. Yeah, he is here, Captain Ibrahim. <laughs> jaddi, Jaddi. Chabuk, Chabuk. Dek, Dek. Jazakallah khair. Barakallah fiq. Jazakallah khair. And takbir. Allahu Akbar. He's going to be a soccer player, inshallah. He's a good guy. Jazakallah khair. Uh, the question for tonight, typically, typically, if someone has an intimate relationship with his wife during the day of Ramadan, they will have to fast 60 days after Ramadan. For sure, in hadith, everything. But what if someone is traveling with his wife and they have an intimate relationship during the day of Ramadan? Do they fast 60 days after or what should they do? Uh, if you know the answer, you need to do a lot of research. If you know the answer, email me before tomorrow, Asr at Imam Mustafa Tanatolia Center, Jazakum Lahir.